Now that there's a couple dozen episodes of the podcast out there, I've gotten a lot of feedback from people, usually in the forms of private messages on Twitter or some email or just simply reading the comments on YouTube or elsewhere. And it's quite obvious that for some people, you know, it's just an enjoyable romp. For others, it's very meaningful because I go into subjects that others don't. And for yet others, there's an emotional level to what I'm talking about that they don't hear from other history of technology. And so in that vein, I figure we'll go for one of those subjects that has great personal meaning to me, that has emotions that dig deep, and that in its own way reflects the fragile nature of humanity. I'm speaking, of course, of personalized file index systems. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Brenda Romero, Jeff Atwood, Daniel Boyd, and the hundreds of other supporters on podcast.textfiles.com who have helped me get myself out of debt. Part of what my job involves is going through a variety of estates, uh, whether they're digital or physical, uh, either people who have uh, passed on or people who are changing the nature of their lives and just handing over lots and lots of physical materials or maybe just a large zip file. And it's at that moment, by some standards, that I am reaching the apex of that person's collecting and acquiring life. When we look at computer technology, we discover that people are given an agency over the files and materials and media that they create. They have things that they themselves made or that they downloaded or that they were given, and these materials very quickly can grow out of control. People call it digital hoarding, but in fact, it's kind of the nature of what these computers are. I mean, you don't start building up hundreds and hundreds and later thousands and thousands of individual items and then not sit back and concern yourself with how am I ever going to keep track of this going forward? We've always had this problem. We've had it with photographs, with books, with writings. People create a bunch of disparate things in a medium, and then they want to find it again quickly. And almost as soon as computers fell into the hands of regular people, they started to create items that held their code and files that meant something to them. Initially punch cards, digital tape, cassette tapes, floppy disks, zip disks, CDRs, other optical media, hard drives. And people would put these aside, but would quickly want to have access to them. And that's where indexing systems come into play. As people hand over their life's work to me. I have seen all sorts of methodologies that folks use to keep track of their old things. In the case of floppy disks, there were paper labels to stick to the front of the disk, and you could write whatever you wanted on them. Some people would write something as simple as documents, pictures, important files, Others would come up with a numbering system. They would have disks that were numbered from 1 to 100 or 1 to 1,000, and then somewhere else, either on the disk themselves or on a piece of paper, they would write out what was on those disks. I have people who would print out the directory of the disk and then put that on a sticky label that itself was on the front of the disk, so the disk itself was its own directory, as well as having the directory on the disk. Others would make a book, and the book would have a list of all of these different floppy disks, along with their special number, and then a short description or maybe even a long description of what was on the disks. Some people had a special index disk. This one would contain directories and descriptions of everything, usually written in some proprietary word-processed format, and it's from that they would either print out a book or they would just simply maintain it on there. 
Uh, some people even used database programs, spreadsheets. They used all sorts of methods to contain all of the information that they were gathering for easy finding later. This is a rapidly disappearing activity. With the use of all sorts of operating system-based search engines, along with the search engines that are living on the web, folks are getting away from having a large amount of stacks uh, of all of the different things they've saved that they have to pull from. Now you would simply look for a phrase, it would tell you where the phrase appeared, and then you would just go to that file. You could even specify what sort of file you thought it was, and then put the information that you thought was on that disk in a sort of fuzzy way, and then it would sort of come up with what it thinks might be the items you're looking for. But that's for the relatively lucky people of the present. I don't deal in that. What I do is walk onto the stage at the end of the play, after a person has spent a lifetime collecting items onto floppy disks or onto punch cards or onto cassette tapes, and then building up what I think their collection meant. And let me tell you, everybody, everybody is different. It's kind of fascinating, really, how much the indexing system is a reflection of the personality of the person themselves. For my own bit, I actually saved all of my text files on a series of disks with progressively weirder labels. They would say things like, man, quite a lot of text files here, or can't get enough of these text files, or here are a bunch of groovy text files. Text files galore. Text files a la mode. In fact, sometimes I would just simply call them the works. I had a name for my BBS five years before I actually put the BBS up. I knew that when I created my BBS, it would actually be called the works. And so I started making floppy disks full of text files for this eventual BBS. I mean, I was 12 years old. There was no way I was going to get my hands on my own phone line, no time soon. And so I had my BBS living on a bunch of floppies called The Works, and I knew the day would come that The Works would live. The Works finally came to life in 1986, and then it lived for maybe a year and a half, two years, before transferring out to a bunch of people in Boston. But I've told that story. And the works BBS text file floppies would live at my parents' house for years, uh, well into the 90s, before I finally noticed, uh, as I've told many times before, that there weren't any text file and BBS collections on the web, and I thought I better go find my old text files and get them online. So when someone comes to me with a stack or a zip file or a hard drive uh, representing their collections of their youth, I know what they're going through because I went through it myself. You have spent your life, literally your life, uh, putting all of these files together. And the method by which you gathered them, it could have been everything from downloading them from FTP sites or bulletin board systems, uh, putting them together and, and packing your media as tight as it possibly could be, and knowing that in these containers stood all of the many wondrous things that your machines could do. Here's some ray tracing you worked on. Here's a file you wrote. Here's a shareware program that plays an amazing game or gives you some important piece of information if you type in the right amount of numbers. There were all of these jewels hoarded away, put into this treasure chest of floppies. But for what? This is the question that I've had to ask myself so many times. Was it worth it? Was it worth it to spend hours and hours sitting on a modem deep into the night, knowing that my father was going to yell at me the next day, hoping that this 148K file would download correctly and that it was in a format I could read or that the requirements of my machine would be up to the task? That I would go through hundreds, I mean hundreds, of file listings, looking at each listing watching the online clock because I might only have 40 minutes to get anything I wanted, and then putting down on a piece of paper 
what interested me and then downloading them one by one. Ways to make it easier and, and automatically do it. I mean, that all came later. People could designate a bunch of files and then it would automatically zip them all up and send it down to you. I mean, there were some really great features in the 1990s to make mass file downloading easy, but not in the 80s. I mean, in the 80s, I was stepping through, spending countless, countless hours assembling some sort of vision. What was I assembling? Where did I think this was going? And, and now uh, I'm in a world where just in the last week I had a collection that I put up. And, and that collection is 2.2 terabytes of information. Terabytes. I couldn't imagine that level of information falling through my hands in the 1980s. That's four days of work now. Thematic gathered items brought together by a whole host of folks to make a machine come back to life. And that's just one collection of what I might do in a standard month for the Internet Archive. You know, it's like years of my life worked out to something like 50, 60 megabytes of text, compressing itself down into almost nothing. And, and here we are now. I have folks who walk up to me with a hard drive, where the hard drive is them, their youth, their 20s, their 30s, their teenage years, boiled down into an index and then offering it to me to make it live. So in some ways, the Internet Archive and the work I do there is the final chapter. It's the chapter where all of these materials will now live ostensibly forever and of great use to somebody. Here's a collection I'm particularly proud of. David W. Niven, he loved jazz, and so he bought a bunch of 78 RPM shellac records uh, all through his youth. He spent all of his money on it. It was one of those cases where it almost became an obsession for him. He was using his salary to just buy hundreds and hundreds of these records, and he loved them, and he learned so much about jazz and which musicians played on which record and, and what that career was involved in. And, and when he got to be older, he realized that he could sell this collection, this beloved collection of shellac records, for a pretty hefty sum. And, and in some ways, it was like an investment that had paid off. He wanted money to pay for his children's college education and, and just be able to go into retirement. So he sold it all, but not before he did a very special thing. He assembled all of his records and he recorded them onto tape. And before he recorded each record or set of records, he would record himself saying all sorts of biographical and trivial information related to a given artist. So he might have a collection of Duke Ellington performances, and then he would record himself talking about the history of that jazz musician, followed by actual songs from that musician. And I mean, he would know who the drummer was. He would know who arranged it. I mean, let's be clear, the man was a living encyclopedia. When all was said and done, he had recorded hundreds of hours of these records and these tapes, and his goal had been to have it for his children. In the same way that he had fallen in love with jazz, he wanted to share it so they could fall in love with it too. But there the story... It doesn't work out. His kids just weren't interested in jazz. They weren't interested in the story that their father had to tell. Their father's obsession wasn't of much interest to them at all. So David had sold all of his records, and he had hundreds of hours of his tapes talking about the jazz history that he thought was going to slip out of his fingers and go into oblivion. But Kevin Powers, who had met David Niven, uh, talked to him about digitizing these tapes and making them available. Uh, in the interim time, David ended up donating them to a local school, and, and that's how Kevin had heard that there was a collection. And so Kevin offered to digitize and index these tapes, which he did. 
in every case, there were handwritten labels on the back of the cassettes that told you what musicians were being covered. Kevin typed all of those in, turned them all into MP3 and WAV files, and did his best to turn things digital. But then it was only in one place, and it wasn't easy for the kids to get to it at this school. Kevin approached me. I more than happily put it on the Internet Archive, and the David W. Niven Jazz Collection was born. It's been up there for a couple years now, and people have listened to them by the thousands. Folks who know about this and who stumble onto this collection, they're blown away by David Niven's encyclopedic knowledge. They're blown away by this vault of jazz history that David Niven assembled. It is an instructional waterfall uh, telling you all the aspects of this jazz music and walking you through it, followed by playing it. Now, he's not well recorded. He just kind of recorded ambiently inside of his office. But if you listen, like a true teacher, it is so rewarding. So David, who had known that his tapes were sitting somewhere in a high school, was overjoyed when Kevin explained to him that it was now on the internet at large and that thousands and thousands of people were making their way to the collection and listening to it. That was the happiness at the end of David Niven's story. He died uh, just about two weeks ago, uh, but he had known what was going on and I'm pleased we were able to do something with his indexed work. There's a number of people who are doing this kind of musical indexing on the Internet Archive. One of the great ones is Crap from the Past. You have a DJ who, since his college years in the 1990s, has been assembling really terrible pop music. You know, all of the kind of commercialized, overworked stuff that just seems to clog the airwaves all through the last 50 years. Not the true classics that change emotions, but just the kind of disposable music, you know, songs that are either novelty in nature or the most dull subjects you can imagine. And he assembles them into a very amusing package once a week. And he's been doing it ever since then. And to our great surprise at the archive, he has been meticulously indexing and uploading his shows. And even when he started in 2005, he started putting all of his old shows up, uh, going all the way back to his college years. And so it's all up on the Internet Archive. Hundreds of shows across dozens of years of crap from the past. I stumble on to people who just make it a point to upload collections of scanned materials or who have some sort of thematic file, and they'll upload them all sorts of ways. You know, the rules on the archive are pretty open, so somebody will sometimes upload a, a zip file with no description, or they'll describe what it is, but they'll put it in a format that's kind of difficult to look at. And so part of my job is to approach them and make it playable on the archive. But once I do that, you know, once we have a collection, Collection up, and it's several hundred uh, specimens of some sort. The next question is, who's coming? Who's going to be there? Who wants it? So, I don't know when the next call is coming. I know the call is coming. It's where somebody will contact me and let me know about a relative that's gone, or that they themselves are moving, uh, going to a different space, going to a smaller space. They know that they have reached the end of holding some item, and they want me or somebody I can put them in contact with to take it to the next level, whatever that is. People are always using phrases with me like, I hope there's some use for this, or I'd rather it wasn't all for nothing. And if I can do something, whether it's digital ingestion, arranging for scanning, or just holding it a little while longer, I'm happy to be that next level. And the hope is that some person some student as yet unborn, some researcher in another part of the world, some historian, writer, some regular person who just is looking at neat stuff, finds this cache, this collection, this index, 
looks up, looks around at people no longer here, and just gently mouths, thank you. This has been Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. I'm Jason Scott. Thanks to Sam Johnston, James Bakoyanu, and the hundreds of other supporters who are helping make this podcast possible, allowing me to get my way out of debt. Uh, I've connected with my tax guy, Rich Hell, and Rich and I are going to get all of my papers together, and he's going to give me a number. I'm probably going to have to defer payment and pay a little interest because the income from the podcast, uh, actually, ironically, has probably caused some amount of tax increase. But I'm going to be very happy that I'll be paying off one unified tax debt instead of all the other debts that I've had lying around. I mean, so many of these things have gone into the win column. I cannot thank you enough for that. This whole podcast has been a wild success along that range. And for the people who are supporting me and wondering if it's having a positive effect, oh, I promise you, my spine is straighter, my eyes are brighter. Uh, I stopped thinking about so much that was on my plate that I'm getting to the point of forgetting how much concern and worry was a part of my daily life. That's a gift I will not overlook, that I will not stop acknowledging, and I will not stop thanking you all for.